glad you came out of the cold <laughs> to come to this cherished safe haven for readers and writers. But this evening, we're so very fortunate to have two women here who are exemplars of what reading and editing and writing is about. Adrian Brugger <coughs> and Lauren Wee. Lauren is the editor of a wonderful book, Wild Game, My Mother, Her Lover, and Me. Adrian has written a book, a memoir, that rings with the character development, detail, dialogue, suspense, plot of a 19th century novel, except for the subject matter. <laughs> <laughs> she has had a career, 20 year career in publishing, editing, writing, she started a literary magazine with Francis Ford Coppola. I'm sure there's a story there, but we'll stay on topic. Um, and is director of Aspen Word, part of, part of Aspen Institute. Adrian is now having edited and published the book when she was executive director at Harcourt, now Houghton now Mifflin, Harcourt. She has started a small press, an imprint of Simon and Schuster called Avid Reader. And reading the mission statement, I was so charmed and inspired that I'd like to share it with you. Built on the idea that the most rewarding publishing has three common denominators. Great books, published with intense focus, and true partnership. The staff at Avid Reader Press, a small band of cheerful literary warriors, strives to publish every book with avidity. Who wouldn't want to be a reader or a writer involved with them? So this evening we have two literary warriors among us. Wake up, sweetie, wake up. A mother tries to rouse her sleeping 14-year-old daughter. She says, I'm going to need your help with this. The help is to be a co-conspirator, protector, accomplice, in an illicit love affair with an adored stepfather of the author and the best friend of the mother's husband. The little girl, because that in fact is what 14-year-old girls are, although they would have you think of them differently, <laughs> is thrilled to be a part of her mother's drama. So let us hear about that drama. Thank you so much for the introduction. I did not write the Avid Reader mission statement. <laughs> I'm happy to, to be participating in it, but it's, those are not my words. I wish they were. Um, Adrian, will you start us off by giving us um, from the beginning of Wild Game, just to give everybody a sense of that kind of crucial first moment. Right, absolutely. And first of all, I just want to thank you all for coming tonight and braving the cold. And thank you to the Library Society for this gorgeous room and to um, book, uh, Corner Books for selling the books tonight. And to this, this woman right here who is, um, was a good friend of mine before she became my editor, but who I'm so indebted to for her help and support and advocacy of this book from day one. So I will get right to it and, um, and read from the opening chapter. Um, Wild Game essentially tells the story of my very complicated relationship with my mother, Malabar, 
And um, the opening scene, um, which we heard a little bit about, is this very pivotal moment in my life, arguably the most pivotal moment <laughs> in my life. Um, and I think the only things you need to know are that the year was 1980 and the setting was Cape Cod. We were at my mother's home, our family home on the Cape. And there had been, um, so the characters are my mother Malabar, her husband, my stepfather Charles, um, and then we had weekend guests, the Southers, Ben and Lily Souther. And I think that should do it. Um, my nickname was and is Rennie. So when you hear Rennie, that's, what, that's who they're talking about. Wake up, Rennie. I felt a hand on my shoulder and pulled the sheet over my head. Rennie, please. Even before I turned and saw her face, I could hear a peculiar quaver in my mother's whisper and smell the remnants of the Pinot Noir. Her voice sounded hesitant and desperate. The mattress sank where she lowered herself beside me and my body stiffened against the depression. I kept my eyes shut and steadied my exhalations. Rennie! The whisper, more urgent now, still held an unfamiliar tremor. She pulled down the sheet. Please, wake up. At this, I opened my eyes. Malabar was in her nightgown, her hair must. I sat up. Mom, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Ben Souther just kissed me. I took in this information, tried to make sense of it, couldn't. I rubbed my eyes. My mother was still there beside me. Ben kissed me, my mother repeated. A noun, a verb, an object, such a simple sentence really, and yet I couldn't comprehend it. Why would Ben Souther kiss my mother? It wasn't that I was naive. I knew that people kissed people they weren't supposed to. My parents had not shielded me from stories of both of their transgressions during their marriage, and in this way, I knew more about infidelity than most children. I was four when my parents broke up, six when my father remarried, seven when that new marriage started to fall apart, and eight when my mother was finally able to wed Charles, who'd been, married, who'd been separated from, but still married to his first wife when they met. Ben was married, too, of course, to Lily. The Southers had been married for 35 years. Mom and Charles, Ben and Lily. The four of them had been couple friends for as long as my mother and stepfather had known each other, about a decade now. And that's what really stumped me about the kiss, the friendship between Ben and Charles. The two men adored each other, their affection went back some 50 years, maybe more, to a time when they were young enough to skip stones across the flat gray water of Plymouth Bay, where they pretended to be pilgrims and built forts in the dunes, fending off imaginary enemies with stick muskets. Over the years, they'd hunted and fished together, dated each other's sisters, been ushers at each other's weddings, and become godfathers to each other's sons. What do you mean Ben kissed you? Suddenly, I was fully awake. I pictured her slapping him in response. That was something my mother might do. What happened? We took a walk after dinner, just the two of us, and he pulled me into him like this. My mother crossed her arms around herself, simultaneously demonstrating Ben's caress and embracing its memory. Then she collapsed the rest of the way onto the bed, smiling, and stretched out alongside me. Apparently, there'd been no slap. <laughs> I still can't believe it. Ben Souther kissed me, she said. What was it about her voice tonight? He kissed me, Rennie. There it was again, joy. A tone I hadn't heard from her since before Charles's strokes. Joy had fallen from the night sky and landed in my mother's voice. One kiss, the gleam and shine of it, what it might portend, had changed everything. And so, there was that. <laughs>
What I didn't know in that moment, of course, was that this would mark the beginning of what would become just an epic love affair between my mother and Ben Souther, my stepfather's best friend. But what I did know, sort of even in real time, in the immediacy of that moment, that it was one of those moments with the before and an after. And I had gone to bed as my mother's daughter, a child, and I woke up, you know, in this fully provocative adult world where I was her confidant and best friend and um, and co-conspirator. So, so raise your hand if this has happened to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and yet, somehow, this book has struck a chord with every single person who's read it has. It has resonated for them in some way, um, which we will talk about soon. Um, but I wanted to know first why you have lived this for a very long time. This has been your story for a very long time, and many years have passed. And why did you decide to write the book now? What, what, what was it that enabled you to write it now all these years later? Probably the 40 years of processing time helped. <laughs> um, you know, it's a great question, and the truth is, I, I, I think I've been, it is my seminal story, it is the story that had sort of, as I just said, changed my direction and it's, I've sort of always, I think about it a lot, I always wonder what would have happened had it not happened, how my life just catapulted in this strange direction. Um, so I've always sort of written and thought and told stories around it and I think, you know, when I was younger it was sort of some overwrought bad short stories happened <laughs> and later in my life I mean even you pointed out earlier when I when I met you I I kind of played it for laughs like it just it was I think it was a defense mechanism for something that was really painful it's like oh, oh my ex-husband is my stepbrother and you know all this <laughs> all this um kind of trying to keep it light and then I think at some point um which really had to do with um, meeting the man who had become my husband and wanting to start a family of my own and actually having children and you know if, if having children isn't revelatory I don't know what is <laughs> but they change everything and of course um, there was actually a moment literally immediately when I was in the hospital I had just given birth to my daughter and I was coming upstairs and my mother and my stepfather um, were there to greet me and I remember having this, just being so excited to introduce my mother to her first grandchild, and then literally having this experience in which I couldn't speak and couldn't breathe. And, you know, call it a panic attack, call it whatever, but, you know, as that um, wonderful book, The Body Keeps the Score, I mean, my body was telling me something my mind wasn't, that I, despite the fact that I thought I had dealt with all of this in therapy and through literature and through talking to friends, like something happened to me in confronting this new generation with the previous one that I just recognized I had work to do. I had to think about this and I had to sit with it and understand it in order to not, you know, unthinkingly pass it along. And I think it's it's interesting, we both have 14 year old daughters right now. Right? Yes. So your so I, I read this as the parent of a 14-year-old. You wrote it pretty much as a parent of a 13, 14-year-old. Who, who your daughter is now the same age you were this night that you right. just described to us. Now, it's, it's interesting because the way that you write it in the book, which I think is truly brilliant, is that it, the way that the book opens before your mother wakes you up that night, it's t like, tell us what's happening before. I mean, that night, there's a dinner party at your mom's house, and then, and you kind of sneak out. No, I sneak out and I canoodle with the boy down on the beach and I'm, I'm having sort of normal 14 year old stuff going on in my life. And, and you're I'm dealing with, and you're kind of like, hmm, this is kind of interesting. You're sort of having this first moment of like becoming your own person. Right. And then when your mom wakes you up that night, she basically hijacks that. Yeah. You're like kind of about to go off on your own, which is what you're supposed to do when you're 14. And she yanks you back, she says, Ooh, it's like it's almost like she sensed it. It's like no, 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 no. You're not going anywhere. I need you here. Yeah. Um, and then and then describe the next few years. Well, you know, so 
Just to step back for one second, because I, I love what you said about having a 14-year-old. And a lot of times I get asked the question of sort of, you know, what's it like to be your mother's age when all this happened and so on. It's been so much more informative to actually see what a 14-year-old is like, because of course, our memory of what we were like at 14 is nothing like what a 14-year-old is like, because of course we knew everything at 14. And I certainly, when I was thinking about who I was, I, I felt, I mean, I felt emp empowered by this in some ways. Like it was, it was, it was actually thrilling to sort of have my mother's, you know, we all want our parents' love, and my mother was sort of very busy, and I didn't get a whole lot of it, and suddenly the high beams of affection were just shining on me. Um, so that was thrilling, but I, I look at my own daughter, and I see, you know, she's wonderful. She's intelligent and gracious and lovely and looks very mature, but I also, like, oh my gosh, she's a child. She's really a kid, and that has been very helpful for me to really see and understand as I was writing this, because it's given me a lot more compassion for myself and who I was at that time, you know, because I've spent a lot of time also questioning, not not the early phases. I, I mean, I really, it's very easy to sort of separate, you know, I was the child, this was really inappropriate and so on. But the fact is what was compelling about, for me to think about and write about was why at these various stage along, stages along the way did I lean in when I should have leaned out? So I think we need, for people who haven't read the book, I think we need to give a little bit of context, which is that after your mom wakes you up that night and kind of says, I, I'm going to need your help, like I yeah. want to, she clearly wants to conduct this affair with her husband's best friend. Yeah. Um, and she says, I need you. Yeah. And you kind of say, okay. And you sign on. I do. And w tell us a little bit about the role you played in the okay. ensuing months and years. So, you know, my mother was this very glamorous, charismatic woman. I mean, she in every way embodied her first name, Malabar. <laughs> I mean, which is I, her real name. Which and is when her you real first name. told me that, I was like, mm. yeah. No, 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 you can't. You can't use that. <laughs> Nobody will believe it. Yeah. yeah. Well, no. That, so that's her name. She was born in India on on Malabar Hill in Bombay, now Mumbai. Um, I actually have often thought, which I wrote in the book, like if she were Anne or Betty, like really, would she? Have, <laughs> would this have all worked out this way? Um, but so she's she was also you know this extraordinary cook. So that's one of the things I remember most. She was this extraordinary cook. She had a food column. She wrote cookbooks. Every meal was a test recipe for us. My whole childhood was just with these really incredible meals. I longed for McDonald's. I did not get McDonald's. Um, but so when, when I'm going to just go in a little bit to the title in order to get us to my role. But so as this affair progressed, um, you know, they fell deeply in love and they were constantly trying to figure out how to spend time together. And they were couple friends. My mom and Charles were great couple friends with Ben and Lily. And so it was in that way sort of weirdly one of these affairs that was carried out in plain view. And so my mother was the cook and one way that they figured they could spend more time together was to do a cookbook together because Ben, of course, was a recreational hunter and fisherman. So wild, they did a wild game cookbook together. And um, it also just was a very perfect title um, for what was going on. But so originally, you know, Ben would sort of come to the cave, Ben and Lily, you know, toting some hunk of meat, um, whether that was boar or venison or something more exotic that he found somewhere. Um, he literally once hit a squirrel on the way to us and that was cooked up as well. Um, but and, but so, so they would have these meals and my role initially, but well, one thing I haven't said is that both of their spouses, my stepfather and Ben's wife, they were in poor health. I mean, they were physically frail for different reasons. Um, but my role was to suggest taking a walk to everyone after dinner. And of course, Ben and Lily would say, I mean, I'm sorry, Charles and Lily would say, you know, no, no, no. And I would t go out with them. And it just looked so innocent, right? You know, I was a 13, 14 year old young chaperone 
Um, and we would skip out the door and up Tonset Road, and I would peel off, and they would spend time together. So that was sort of my major role initially. And then, you know, by the time I went off to college and stuff, it was more just sort of being a constant, you know, person on the phone, what should I do now, hearing the problems, um, you know, there were, when there were close calls, she would just tell me what was worrying her or not. And I, and I would try to pull back, but I would, I would just get swept back in. Um, when did, I mean, when, so, I mean, the way that I've often come to think about the book is that you were, it's almost like you were living your mother's dream, and then at a, and then at a certain point, you you woke up from it, and you thought, God, I wait, what what just happened? Yeah. And where did all those years go? And, and what what do I want? And who am I? Right. So, tell me how that happened. <laughs> okay. No, no biggie. What? <laughs> no biggie. You know, <laughs> just. Um, so when I got when I got most embroiled. Um, I'm just going to cut right to this, <laughs> not too much backstory. When I got most embroiled was on, at my stepfather had died, um, my mother actually went through a genuine period of mourning, I mean she was devastated and felt terrible and, you know, unsurprisingly was wrapped with guilt and so on. And then she was also, still having the affair with, with um, Ben at I, the time. I, I think it was ongoing on some level, but I, you know, she was... I don't. I don't know the details of how much there was. You know, they were seeing each other at that point in time. Also, because the very balance of it had changed. They were. Um, you know, she was a third wheel now. They weren't really having the dinners in the same way, and so on. In any case, about a year after uh, Charles died, my mother um, sort of constructed a family vacation that we would have with the Southers. and so it was going to be on this island in the Caribbean. Um, um, Harbor Island, and you know they rented a big house, and lots of extended family were all coming. And I, my mother and I, arrived first with um, Ben and Lily Souther, and their son, who I'd never met, who lived in California, came in the first tranche early, and you will be shocked to know <laughs> that I fell in love with my mother's lover's son. So um, this is one of the things of questioning how I made the web much more tangled. Um, so wait, what was your question? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, it's, it, it is such a, it's, it's such a complicated, complex story. And, and I think it's because your psychology with your mother was so incredibly enmeshed that yes. it really, it, it really became enacted in in real life, in the world. I mean, it just became harder and harder to extricate. Yes. You just became, you got more, more and more deeply. Yeah, okay, now I'm remembering the yeah. question, which is, you know, at some point in time, I woke up sort of realizing I was married to a lovely guy, but the wrong guy. I was living in California, which is great for Californians. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I was in the wrong profession. I mean, I'd been, I, I'd gotten a master's in public policy, but over this period of time, too, I, I had actually become a very serious reader. And I hadn't been a kid who was with the flashlight under the bed reading all the time. I became a reader as an adult. My, my father's um, third wife owned an independent, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> independent <laughs> bookstore. Um, in San Diego, which is where I lived when I was out in California, and she was the person who just started pressing books into my hands, and they changed my life. But so, essentially, one day I sort of woke up in the wrong place with the wrong person, and just sort of really, everything collided, and I went through an incredibly enormous, horrible depression that lasted several years, and it was as I kind of climbed my way out of that, that I realized that I needed to change everything. Which, I mean, I think you know, I, it's, it's interesting because, you know, obviously, generationally, not, therapy was not as much of a, con there, there weren't, I feel like there weren't as many um, ways to kind of confront the, our, our, our demons or our patterns or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, your mother, we, we, I feel like we've kind of painted her as a, well, as a pretty um, 
pretty strong narcissist. I mean, and, and, but the interesting thing that you do in this book is that she's not a villain. I mean, there yeah. are no villains in this book. It's a, it's a really treacherous story, but everybody is drawn with so much, it's so balanced and so with so much kind of empathy. Um, and I think, first of all, I think that's what makes the, the book extraordinary. And I think, I think it's rare that for, for somebody to tell their story and not, and be able to, to pull that off, to, to bring both sides to it, um, and, and not, not play it, not make it sensational. Um, but you, you show your mother as a pretty complex person, in part because you give us her backstory, which had so many tragic twists and turns. Right. And, and I feel it was one of the great gifts of, of writing this memoir, is that um, you know, people often ask me if I forgive her, and really for, forgiveness took a back seat to understanding her, and during the process of diving into her life and really putting myself in her shoes, I developed a lot of compassion for her. I, you know, however I'm sure nutty my childhood sounds like to all of you, it was nothing. It was a walk in the park compared to hers. Um, she was an only child of alcoholic parents who were, uh, you know, just incredibly self-centered. And they'd been married and divorced and married and divorced to each other. There was a whole, when I talked about this legacy of deception, my grandfather had a whole nother family. I mean, there were just so many affairs and things going on. And, um, you know, one of the things that I knew when I wrote this book, you know, and, and you, I have been sort of sharing what I imagine is sort of the worst side of Malabar. I mean, she was also fantastic. She was very warm and affectionate. She was a lot of fun when I was a child. We, you know, we went on great adventures and, and really, you know, she was, she had her terrific side of qualities. And I think, you know, it sounds a little cliche, but I think we're all better than our worst moments. Um, this was a pretty bad one. <laughs> but um, I, I remember when I was writing the book, and I know Lauren knows this story, but I, when I was writing the book, I came upon, um, a Vivian Gornick quote that was in the book, The Situation in the Story, and it was this line that made me sort of understand how I needed to write my mother's character. And the line was, um, in order for the drama to deepen, you must show the loneliness of the monster and the cunning of the victim, mm -hmm. of the innocent, I'm sorry, the cunning of the innocent. Mm -hmm. And that was really just my guidepost for writing it, because I, I felt like you know, you can see Malabar, if you understood why Malabar was Malabar, and, and honestly, some people have responded to the book with admiration. She was sort of a feminist before her time, doing everything the way people told her to, had not worked out for her. And, you know, she, she went for the things she wanted in life. She, you know, I had this conversation with an interviewer recently who sort of talked about how historically adulteresses in literature i mean what happens to them you know they throw themselves in front of trains they have the scarlet letter like nothing good happens well malabar got the guy and had a, 20 years of a happy marriage i mean so it's sort of you know she she bucks a lot of um you know systems and trends and she lost a child which... and she lost a child i mean she and and my stepfather who she was married to um when she fell in love with ben my stepfather I think truly was the love of her life. He had four massive strokes in five days before they got married, was paralyzed on his right side. You know, so the more of the backstory you get, the more you can see, okay, you know, there's just more to it. There's always more to all of these things. And she, yeah, I mean, the thing about her also is that she's just very transactional, right? There's like, her, her currency is material. You know, that's something that which I think also happens to only children with parents who are absolutely And like, who are know, deprived yes. emotionally. Yes. It's like, they, that's where they put, I mean, I learned a lot from that about, about just like psychology in general. When I was reading about her and I thought, I know people like this who, yeah. and, and it's not that they're bad people, it's just that they're projecting, they're, they, they're just, they're giving, it's the only currency they have. Yes, you know? very much so. Um, I mean, which, which makes me think of the necklace. Um, which we haven't talked about at all. But this this is will be meaningful only really for people who've read the book. But there's um, there's kind of a theme throughout the book, which is, I mean, you can speak to it. A okay. Bit. So 
The necklace, I have to give a tiny bit of backstory, but I, I just told you, I think, that my mother's parents were married and divorced and married and divorced to each other. And for anyone who is the child of divorced parents, which I obviously am, um, you know, no matter how bad the marriage is, you have this secret wish that your parents are going to get back together. I don't know why, but like everyone I know who has divorced parents when they're little, you sort of secretly harbor this fantasy that somehow they're going to get back together. Well, my mother actually lived that fantasy. She saw her parents get back together. And when her father came back into their lives and she was there when he proposed, he proposed with this incredible necklace um, that he had, he lived mostly in India, that he bought in India, that my grandmother had been loved, and it just was, you know, these big stones and, you know, diamonds and beading with, with pearls, and, and it, it kind of took this mythic proportion in my mother's heart. I mean, she just, she literally would describe that necklace as, um, unappraisable was the word she used, which of course we all know is ridiculous. But that's, I mean, she, and she was educated, but she really believed the necklace was, you know, the holy grail, it was worth more than anything. And she, unlike how, when, when her parents' marriage failed, um, my grandmother gave it to her as I, I believe a college graduation present. My mother, my entire life, wanted to give the necklace to me, tried to give the necklace to me, would say, if you're very good, you'll get the necklace. And then it would be like, but I really should leave it to a museum. It's so valuable. It's so this. But, but I will give it to you. You know, I'll, I'll let you wear it at your wedding. You know, it would go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and so... Well, no, I mean, I was just thinking, like, there's a pivotal, there's a few pivotal moments in the book involving oh, the one with the, at the, the wedding. At the, well, I just found that so moving. We were talking about it before. And so her, your mother basically says, you, you know, you will wear this necklace yeah. at your wedding. She's, she said I could wear the necklace at the wedding, and I actually got this, you know, this um, collar style dress so that I could, you know, handle this necklace, which really is, is so much more for Malabar than me. I've never worn the necklace. Um, <laughs> I would always feel like I was sort of, you know, in my a five-year-old in your mother's high heels wearing it. Um, but, you know, I was going to wear it to my wedding. And what you need to know is right before the wedding, <laughs> in spectacular timing, um, Lily found out about the affair that had been going on for 10 years. So then she also has to understand that her son is about to marry, you know, the evil woman's daughter. And um, it was one of the most, I, I, the dinners that happened then were just the most painful of my entire life. In any case, my, Ben, instead of, as he'd always agreed to, you know, when, if and when it was discovered, the promise, of course, was I will come rushing to you, Malabar. Of course, when it actually happened, um, he dropped my mother like a hot potato and there was no contact. And my mother obviously was beside herself in incredible pain and missing him and longing for him. And the only time she was going to see him, the next time she was going to see him, was at this wedding. And so it became more her wedding than my wedding. And when I came home beforehand and she was depressed and, you know, just in terrible shape, but she was also getting invigorated by the idea that she was going to be seeing him soon, that she had this one chance to kind of win him back. And we were up in her bedroom talking about um, the dresses, mine and hers, and she was showing me this, you know, fabric that she bought and this beautiful dress she was going to make. And, um, and the necklace, which I hadn't seen in years, was sort of open, this purple case was open and sparkling on the bed. And she said, and this will be the piece de resistance. And she put it up to her neck. And I realized in that moment that she was going to wear the necklace at my wedding. <laughs> and this, can I, I remember this in the editorial process so clearly, where I was like, and this is where you get outraged. And this is where you stand up to her, right? And I was like, and I, I wish. Like, no, no, you were just like, no, she needed to wear the necklace. No, and this was something no one could understand, and everyone to this day is like, Aren't, were you mad? I mean, I'm mad now. I, I understand. Like, I can relate to everything you guys are thinking. Like, of course, it's horrible, and I, I should have been mad, but at the time, I was still so much a part of her. I still saw the world, like, through my mother's eyes, 
that I thought, hey, I'm going to marry this nice guy. My life is good. I've got a pretty dress. Like it, it all seemed okay with me. And she had so much more at stake. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course she needs the necklace. I don't need the necklace. We were so deep in this in 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 this process, and I did not understand that yet because I. No, you I, were you were like a little more angry. I was like, you gotta be angry. You're angry. You were like, mm -hmm. it's a memoir. No, <laughs> have to tell the truth. It comes when it comes, but yes. it really had not come yet. So it was really a learning process for me because because I think there there you really did kind of work this through in real time. I, yes. I in the writing of the book. I think um, I think in some in some yeah. ways there there were moments where you had to push yourself to. To, to go to, to feel something that you didn't want to feel because it's very painful. True. Um, we have to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I was I was just thinking that I was thinking that my favorite memoirs. I think mo most of the I, I think a, a lot not even just memoirs fiction too. I think the most inter interesting story out there is is the story of of individuation and and the story of anybody who is just trying to become to become themselves. I mean, everybody's born into a family, everybody has to find themselves within the family, and then they kind of have to figure out who they are outside of the family. Um, you had a particularly um, challenging, <laughs> challenging um, set of coordinates right. to deal with. Um, and I, I think that your children are gonna have an easier time of it, I imagine, I because so. you've done a lot of that work. I mean, right. um, but no, to, to go back to the editorial process, I, I, what, another thing that I think is extraordinary about the book is that you, you manage to balance this incredible immediacy. I mean, if anybody who reads that first section of this book, I mean, it is like you are there, you are on Cape Cod, you are eating that food, you are smelling the air, you are, you're in that moment. Um, and yet, you're right, that's your 14-year-old, you, you capture that incredible immediacy from many, many years ago, and I think, um, I remember reading something about Wild, about um, uh, an interview I think with her editor, where she where she says, "I think the amazing thing about this book is that she captures the immediacy of her journey, but it's at a distance of 20 years or something, or 30 years. Like yeah. you need that time to process everything. You need that Absolutely. distance. Like this book, if you had written it 20 years ago, would have been a very different book. Absolutely. I mean, and I think largely because I hadn't had children yet too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that was sort of a pivotal." rethinking of it as well because yeah. I understood more what what had been at stake and the choices that were made I mean we all only get one childhood and we only have one set of parents and so whatever our childhood is it seems normal and mine did seem normal to me um, so it, it took a long time to sort of realize well I and and to to, to speak to that um, you, there's a story in the book that I, I love. It is truly one of my favorite stories about um, when. So after she and um, she and Jack, um, <laughs> her stepbrother, that, that marriage doesn't last shockingly, but she winds up. You wind up with somebody wonderful. Yes. Um, but when they tell okay. this amazing story, I, I think I know where you're getting at. Um, so what the story also says to me is how. Um, you know, you can move past your childhood, and people, you know, are very eager to, for me to have like a lot of the questions are, you know, so that that's behind you now. You're all you're all better, kind of, and so on. But you can't, you know, the way you see the world is the way you see the world. So um, I am married to a great guy, and he has the most incredibly high functioning family I've ever met. And I remember when I first met him, I was thinking, yeah, no way. Um, <laughs> And kind of, I would, I would find the chink in the armor, and you know, over time, it was clear that it was a pretty solid piece of metal. And um, and his his family's just lovely. So he's one of six. There are fifteen grandchildren. Um, but his when his father died, which was about um, seven or eight years ago now, we all descended on his saintly mother, um, my mother-in-law, to just grieve with her and be with her that. Day and for you know we stayed there a long while and there were all these stories being told and it was such a sweet moment and then one of the adult um, grandchildren came up and was sort of he had discovered a locked stainless steel box in the basement <laughs> so my husband and my husband's entire family 
smile. They were like delighted that there was a locked box. <laughs> they thought this was great news and like their dad or their grandfather or their husband was gonna communicate sort of from the grave something beautiful. And I alone was beating with sweat and just thinking, what in God's name is wrong with these people? Like a locked box, no good can come of it. And in my family, that is where you would, you know, certainly find an illegitimate child, you know, an affair for sure. You know, the, the least bad thing would be some kind of terrible fetish. But, you know, it, nothing would be good about this. And they were getting, you know, they were trying to find the key and then bobby pins and all this stuff is getting jammed in there. And then they just get a crowbar. And I am about to hurl myself on the table and prevent, you know, I'm looking at my husband like, get your mother out of this drum. And it pops open and it's love letters. It is, this man saved every love letter that my mother-in-law wrote to him during their courtship like 65 years earlier. And my husband just looked at me, you know, like, Renny, like, what is up? But the fact is, this, I won't ever look at a box and not think that. And, and he won't ever look at a box and think the worst. And it's just, it's the paradigm. It's the lens through which I don't think I'll ever be able to change with all the therapy and other stuff in the world. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm happy to look kind of end on a happy note and, and open it up to questions. You guys can drag us down, it's fine. <laughs> um, but if anybody has questions, I think Renny would be happy to answer mm -hmm. them. I love the book. Thank you. I'm curious about the process of writing, whether you brought a completed manuscript to this marvelous editor, whether it was a few sketches. What was the beginning and what was the editorial well, process? Well, this marvelous editor was a friend of mine before she became my marvelous editor, so she knew some of the stories. And in fact, I actually shared before, you know, long ago, some really early pages with you. Um, but the you know, once I, I had written a whole um, draft of the book that wasn't close to what the final draft would be, and when I found my agent, um, she wanted to sell the book on a partial, uh, which just means you sort of polish the heck out of, you know, a chunk of it, and then you kind of sketch out the rest, um, so you sort of, in theory, leave them wanting more and all the rest. Um, so it was sold in that way, and I had a year to write the rest of the book, um, and I, you know, I've worked, I worked. I gave a, I think I gave a pretty polished draft in the end. Um, I think I, I think I texted you and I said A plus. I have nothing to say. <laughs> I think it's perfect. You, know, you helped a lot. She had stuff to say, but I had, you know, I. It, yeah. I mean, I so I sold it on a partial. I had a year to write it. I had already written the draft, so it was really just an intensive polishing and figuring it out process that year of writing. Um, and then, you know, you gave some really astute and tremendous edits that, you know, well, took I, it. I, I, I should also say that the, the proposal that you turned in was extraordinary. And I think that a lot, I, I think it was a combination of um, the story itself was truly sensational and fantastic and un unusual and nobody had ever heard it before, but also the writing was, I mean, you had really worked hard to, and, and you're a beautiful, brilliant writer. It was a combination of, of these two things that really, it's, it's often one or the other, it's rarely both in such a profound and emphatic way, so, which is why 14 publishers tried to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, I've, only, I've been watching you for the last hour, and uh, you spoke about how she's, she has a certain kindness or empathy toward every character, toward everything, actually. Even, even California. <laughs> <laughs> she always says, it's just, it's just the way I feel. It's not the way it really is. And I think you came into the world this way. And that, you, you just are the essence of that. And what's so wonderful is that you kind of got knocked around by your mother in this, and you got tangled up a bit, but, 
But I'm so pleased that it's all, you just kept walking on your journey because it sounds, it's just wonderful. Oh, sure. You are actually making me feel weepy. Thank <laughs> you. That is the nicest comment. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I have two questions. Number one, is your mother still alive? And has your 14 year old daughter read this book? Those are both great questions. My mother still is still alive. Um, and when I sort of was very serious about writing it around five years ago, I talked to her about it. And, and she obviously knew this was always something I was working on and thinking about. And, um, and she was very helpful. She was a big chronicler of her own life. And she gave me access to photo albums and, and scrapbooks and so on. Since that time, um, starting about two years ago, she's, I mean, it started much sooner, but since it became a, a very serious illness, she's, she's suffering from dementia. So I no longer have any idea how, I don't think she, comp I mean, I talked to her about the book and she comprehends that I've written a book, but you know, the next day I will bring it up again and you know you start from zero each time. She knows who everyone is, she remembers the past beautifully, but I don't think this is stuck in any particular way. As for my 14-year-old daughter, um, she did start the book when it was a galley um, this summer on Cape Cod. I came out of my bedroom one morning and there she was sort of bathed in sunlight reading the book and I was like, oh, <laughs> it's happening. <laughs> Um, and then she put it down, and that could be for a couple reasons. It could be because eh, maybe I don't want to know all this stuff. I mean, she knows the story. I've been open with her. She also has a really great relationship with her grandmother, um, and I never wanted to harm that. Um, but I think the I think the truer thing, or the thing that maybe I just want to be true, is that um, she she's a, a busy, healthy 14-year-old. She's not obsessed with her mother's interior life as I was with my mother's interior life. She had, you know, wants to go on the beach and play with friends, and she reads an entirely, she likes world-building fiction. She likes Rick Riordan. I, I mean, I'm sure this is just a big snooze to her. <laughs> um, I love the book, and your descriptions of the natural world were some of the finest books I've ever read. Thank you. Uh, all through the book, I kept expecting to find out that the necklace was paste. <laughs> I wondered if you ever had it appraised. <laughs> it's unappraisable. I really want to know if uh, your acknowledgments were exquisite. Um, oh, thank and you. you mention your brother, and you say something along the lines of he can write his own story. Yeah. I wondered if he ever became aware of what was going on and what he thought of the book. Um, my brother was aware of what was going on, not immediately, but along the way he became aware. And, you know, the book, the book tells a very specific story about one deception and sort of its repercussions. You know, it was a family that had a lot of secrets and lies, and so he was involved with some, I was involved with some, and I think in that way, um, we never really trusted each other a whole lot. We, we do not have a great relationship. Um, we, uh, you know, I think we always competed in some way for a very limited amount of sunlight and you could be in or out of favor um, with my mother, clearly. Um, so, you know, if there's an upside, I think, I think somehow we've both managed to have very productive and we were, we're both in careers we really love and we've been successful in those careers. We both, this is the astonishing point, we both married super emotionally intelligent people. <laughs> I mean, that is really just, you know, you know, they're really incredible. And even though we haven't worked it all out in our generation, we've created space that our children are best friends. So the three of them are like the three musketeers and they adore each other. And, um, you know, so we've, we've done all right. <laughs> But it is it is a complicated relationship. I will stand up. So you can see. Ooh, oh, it sounds like a fascinating story. I haven't read it yet. But uh, the question I was struck when you said that some of the women are saying that your mother was a true feminist or was a was a feminist because she got she she went out to get what she what was important to her. And I certainly don't have an argument with that. But what I do wonder is, you know, when does that come a point where she needed to sabotage her daughter in order to her daughter's life in order to 
had a life that she right. wanted? And did you consider that? And you know, just this general idea of how much do, what price do we pay in order to get things that we want? In right. Life? No, I mean, absolutely, I considered all of that, and I think. Um, you know, my mother grew up in a, my mother was born in 1931. It was a very different generation. And she was also thwarted in her career as well. Sorry, I can't quite see you. Hi. Um, so she, I mean, this is a woman who should have been a businesswoman. She was dying to go into her father's firm. That was absolutely like not gonna happen. So she had to go sort of do these more traditional routes of writing and cooking and you know things that women could do more easily. And you know, my mother certainly wouldn't have described herself as a feminist, by the way. But I think, you know, in I, I do think in some ways she she took herself seriously and put herself out there. I think that was sort of that's been the um, that's been what people are trying to say, not sort of at the cost of this. I mean, clearly, you know, those decisions are sort of separate from feminism. Those are just bad decisions. Well, I think there's such there's yeah. there's such thing as like a healthy narcissism, and then there's yeah. such thing as like a toxic narcissism. And I think she 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 wanted what she wanted, and, right. and she, it, at a time when I think women didn't weren't really allowed to want things. Weren't supposed to for sure. Yeah. And I just realized I didn't answer your the second part of your question or the first part of your question, which is. Although I haven't had the necklace officially appraised, appraised, I did send a picture several years ago to the um, the antiquities specialist at Christie's, and um, it is a beautiful necklace. It is not what my mother thinks it is. <laughs> my children will not be going to college based on the <laughs> of this necklace, unfortunately. But it's it's a very nice piece. <laughs> that I will never wear. <laughs> now, I wonder if you could, uh, you talked about when you had your uh, daughter in the hospital and you realized that mm -hmm. the old and new generation wanted to do something differently. And if you could talk more specifically about some of the things that you did differently with your daughter. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of, I mean, the most basic thing is I think, you know, we all live in reaction to what we grew up with in some ways. You know, you know what you want to celebrate and do, and you want, you know, the things you want to do very differently. So I think I have a pretty hard line um, of being her parent and not her friend. And it is actually hard because you, I, I, you know, especially now that she's 14 and I'm seeing more of it, I, you know, you get into these little girlfriendy talks and she's giving me makeup tips and telling me, you know, this or that and, you know, about a boy she likes or something. And it, it's not that I'm ever tempted to, but, you know, you, it does feel very chummy sometimes. And so it's, it's really, you know, it's, a, it's an effort to sort of always maintain a certain boundary. I hope very much to be her great friend when she's an adult, for sure. I think there was that. I think the other biggie um, for me is I feel like what my mother didn't receive as a child and what I didn't receive as a child is kind of an understanding of, you know, a sort of a self-awareness. Like this, you know, we all, in our children, we see that they have great strengths and great weaknesses and it's really helpful to let them know, you know, your, your issue is this or you do this so well, but, you know, you have to be careful of, you know, I don't know what it might be, your, your tendency to fudge things or, you know, and I think that's knowing yourself um, and having a, an adult or a parent help you to see yourself and to support you in all aspects of yourself. I think that's really important. And I, I enjoy having those kinds of discussions with my children. Judy. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> I'm curious what you figured out in writing books. <laughs> what, what part did you became more um, okay, the question was, uh, what did I learn writing the book and what became more apparent? And I think one of the things that's hard is sort of, is actually separating out what I learned in life, what I, you know, through the 40 years of processing and the actual writing. I think what writing does so beautifully is it helps organize your thoughts. It helps me know what I think about something so that, you know, you can tell a story, but, you know, in memoir you're also, um, you're making sense of 
what it did to you and how you feel about it. And just having to articulate it is very helpful. I mean, are you asking me more sort of what the things I didn't know or the surprises I discovered writing it? I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think the big surprise was how much literally compassion I felt for every person. I can feel for my brother, I can feel for myself, I can feel for my mother, I can feel for my stepfather. And there are these different moments when people ask, um, you know, it's, what's fascinating is also, who, I know the book I read, but it's probably very different from the book, I know the book I wrote, but it's probably very different from the book you read, and that's your lens. And I remember in one reading, someone was like, you know, really didn't, you know, your stepfather, your poor stepfather, and you know, and I, I was sort of talking to my own dad about it later, and he's like, you do remember that your stepfather had an affair while your mother and I were married. I like, oh, yeah. um, you know, so I just, I think there was some way in which I felt the, like everyone was behaving badly, and everyone sort of had these complicated reasons for behaving badly, and it just, it was sort of, you know, walk a mile in anyone's shoes. And when, and actually when you hear anyone's whole story or you look at really all of it, mm -hmm. it's hard not to feel compassionate for them. Or it, it's hard not to feel compassionate, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you do strike one as a person and as a writer as a very compassionate person. I just was wondering, did you worry about hurting the feelings of the living people? Did you change any names? And did you have any negative reaction from the people in right. the whole story? Because in the end, it reads like fiction, but it's the truth. It's not. <laughs> yeah, no, I worried. You can only imagine how much I worried. Um, I worried about everyone. Both my stepfathers are, are, have died, and one of my stepmothers is no longer alive. Um, my mother and father, my brother, my ex-husband, you know, I, I let them all know that I was going to be writing it. And, and the thing I should say is, this, is, this wasn't any, um, I, didn't, I, I didn't tell any, like, I wasn't the big reveal here. Like, the affair came out before my wedding to, you know, the lover's son. Like, it, it's been, people in my family have known about this for years. Um, so the surprise is probably my level of involvement that most people didn't know about that. Um, but the people I felt protective of in some ways were all these, um, sort of the collateral damage, like, you know, the, the major players knew I was writing it and I talked to them and I sort of felt okay with, with how that went. The people I thought about were like, oh, you know, Charles's, my stepfather's children and his nieces and nephews. So in that way, I did use, the only real names I used, I, I was planning originally just to use my mother, Malabar, and my real name, and everyone else had a pseudonym. In the end, I, I kept my father's name just because he's a living writer and it just felt, it, it felt funny not to. Um, but also, I understand in this age, you know, any one of you could Google me and within two minutes figure out who those men were and so on. So it's more just the idea that, you know, if some niece or nephew, it would just be easier to read without sort of having the whole full name there. But Lauren and I talked about this before the book published. I was like, should I be using the real names or not? And, and you know, you, you sort of said it really, people do it all sorts of ways and, and however you feel most comfortable. I think it also allowed me it made it the writing easier for me because I wasn't worried about hurting the feelings in the same way. Like it, it made the truth telling part of it easier. And and I really didn't want to settle any scores or be unfair to anyone, but I did want to tell the truth. And for some reason, you know, Charles being Charles and not his actual name made it easier for me to write about him. I could have at the end done one of those find and replace, um, but I didn't. Marsha. I'm curious about the, the point of transgression. Um, obviously, in that moment, you had no choice but to collude with your mother, you know, because you were 14 years right. old, and all the emotional, you know, um, landscape around that. Right. Have you ever thought about what would have happened if you said absolutely no? Well, you know what I thought more than that is that I think my daughter would just say absolutely no, and I'm kind of like, God, she's. 
so because like every now and then she'll be talking about something and I'll or, you know like some friend and I'll say oh who's that and she's like I'm not telling you mom and I was like those words would have never come out of my mouth I'd be like, oh. that's because she has boundaries and so do you <laughs> so thumbs up um, so I mean she I had the affair for sure no, no matter she, what she but, would have but also it wasn't you know I think it sort of seems more like this. I signed on to be her co-conspirator, which I didn't. She told me this, and then it was like, oh, okay. You know, it was a very gradual process, and it was like hearing this exciting story and getting a little more involved. It wasn't like, are you willing to do this, 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 and this? So it it kind of crept up, and it's hindsight that made me use the term co-conspirator, which really I did start coming up with ideas and how to help and why you, this is a good reason you might have be there at that hour. And, um, but it certainly didn't start that way. And it also, you know, it was just, it was, um, you know, I, I said it already, but it was, it was thrilling. It was so exciting to be so close to her and to be part of something that was so important to her. And I actually sort of felt like I, I was, you know, I really confused that that my mother and I weren't kind of in love or something. I mean, that sounds a little weird. I didn't mean that. But, but it was it was such an intense bonding moment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that all makes sense. I just, I just really wonder if none of that had happened, what your relationship with your mother might have been. And you don't even have yeah. I, I don't, it, yeah. It, it's very curious yeah. what the dynamics would have been had that not happened. <coughs> Maybe not as good in a way. I, I mean, I actually haven't thought that much about that. Mm -hmm. but. Yes, hey there. Um, you. You've spent your career working on behalf of authors yes. and publishing and promoting other people's work. How does it feel to be finally the author? It's, it's terrifying sometimes. <laughs> um, it's been great. You know, I, it actually feels... Um, I just feel so buoyed by the whole experience, you know, for as much anxiety and terror that preceded it and coming out with a story that, you know, even when it's not as personal as this one, any writer, and I, I feel like I've held the hand of so many writers crossing this threshold, just to tell your story publicly and kind of put it out there and then wait for people's reaction. It's really, it's really hard, um, and it's very public. You know, reviews are very public, and now everyone can sort of re review you everywhere. And and it just, it's actually, um, I think I was so scared about, you know, I, I guess obviously being judged or something. Um, but I, the thing I didn't expect was how many people, I mean, I didn't expect at all people to be like, this helped me, this is so relevant, and people wanting to tell me their stories. I mean, I thought I might get this as a lovely book or something, you know, well written, but I didn't, I didn't expect it to start a conversation quite the way it has and how many people have written to me and wanted, to, you know, just to share, um, you know, similar, you know, not necessarily similar as in like my story, but like stories. what the differences are and what might have transpired between that period and now that would have made it a different book? Well, I think, you know, one thing was just developing my writing chops. I mean, I just don't think it would have been good because I don't think I would have been as good a writer. But I think I think I probably still, I would have been angrier and more emotionally, you know, kind of determined that, you know, this bad thing happened and I was, you know, I, I think it, I can't say because I didn't do it, or I certainly didn't do it successfully then, but I think, um, you know, there just was a certain amount of stewing and processing and development that happened, and, um, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to beat the horse, but, you know, the having children just sort of changing everything and sort of understanding um, this importance of legacy, and, and that became a whole other angle to it, which I hadn't even understood before. I would have told a very, I think, much more basic story of events and not of this emotional bigger picture. Art. Yeah. Psycho emotional right. Thank you so much.
if you want to buy books, I think they're going to be going outside.